know this morning in our worship team devotional, we read from John 15. This is Jesus talking. He said, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. So God, we just, we thank you that we can lay our hearts out before you. We can lay our lives out before you, God, that you would use us to love one another. It really is that simple, but sometimes it's so hard, God. So just help us in that. Help us to love our, our friends. Help us to love our neighbors. Help us to love our coworkers. And even help us to love our enemies, God. Help us to see them as you see them as a child of God. So we lay out our hearts before you, God. Take our life. Teach us to love better. Love like you, God. And just thank you and praise you. And just as we continue to worship as by diving deeper into your word, God, that it would teach us to love even more. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated if you would this morning. Uh, youth group, um, you're not dismissed today. Uh, is Julie in here? Yeah, Matt and Julie. Matt, you know, Matt and Julie, can you guys stand up for a minute? Matt and Julie, just you can do it. Stand up. Matt and Julie have been directing uh, our youth group here for a while. Can we give them a round of uh, <laughs> Yes. Um, they are at the first service, and Julie asked uh, youth could stay in here because of the nature of what we're talking about. And I said, if you feel like it's what the Lord wants you to do, that's great. So we're going to go ahead and have them just stay with us this morning, which is uh, good. They're young adults. They can handle it, right? All right. That's the way it is. This morning, we will be reading from First Thessalonians chapter 4 as uh, we march on through, through this book. Um, First Thessalonians, Apostle Paul's writing, and we've been talking about this for the last few months. As you're turning there through your app, your Bible, whatever you use, if, if you don't have that, it's fine. We'll have it on the screen in a few minutes. But as you're turning there, I would like to ask you if you would know how to live. Kind of a profound question, right? If you would know how to live, how to live if you desire to be a uh, let's say a professional athlete this morning. If you would know how to live, if you desire to be a professional athlete, would you be able to put in the time of, uh, for the day to do all the physical conditioning, the, the jogging, the weightlifting, uh, the practice, all, all that goes with that? I get tired just saying the words, amen? amen. Any of you? And of course... To be this uh, professional athlete, uh, don't forget the special diet needed to get the most out of, your diet, uh, out of your diet, right? Out of your body, the special diet that you would need in all this con uh, physical conditioning. Now, how many of you remember the original Rocky back in the 70s? The original, the best. How do you remember when he finally decided to start training? He gets up, he gets up in the morning because he's going to start all this physical conditioning and he starts out with his diet and he gets up in the morning and he cracks the eggs into the glass. And then he gulps them down. How many of you remember that? The special diet that he had, right? I didn't do it the first service and I'm sure not doing it at this service. Are you trying to get me to drink it or are you thankful that I didn't drink it? If you would, <laughs> I turned 55, I turned 55, I'm done with peer pressure. If you would know how to live, my next, in my next line of questioning, if, if you would know how to live is how, how to live if you desire to be a professional money investor. Right? If you uh, wanted to be a professional money investor, how would you be able to to study and understand how the stock uh, the stock market how it works? Be willing to invest. Be willing to invest and take risk, not only with your own money but 
with others' money as well. Learning, learning to have self-control as you watch the ups and downs of the market, to not panic, not pull your money out too soon or leave it, you know, to have all that self-control, to be a professional money investor, knowing when to sell and knowing when to buy. Reminds me of a song, right? Knowing when to hold them, knowing when to fold them. I'm dating myself. And how, how, to, how to handle big wads of, of cash, right? Oh, it's real. It's real. How, as a money investor, would you be able to handle cash? Next in the line of questioning if you would know how to live, uh, really kind of in fun, is how to live if you desire to be a professional food speed eater, right? You know those people that you see eating, they, uh, they enter those contests to see who can eat the most hot dogs or jalapenos or uh, any of those. How many of you have ever seen that takes place? And it's usually the littlest person that puts the most food away. How does that happen? So basically, if Donna and I sat down for a food eating contest, she would win. I clearly have more storage. This is something that I know personally that I've been in training for my whole life. <laughs> to be a professional, would I know how to live? I think I'm handling it pretty good. Here's my point to asking if you would know how to live. You see, no matter what profession you are currently in or what you set your heart on doing, to be the best, to be the best, you must be loyal you must be ambitious. You must be able to put in the time. Uh, you must practice, have self-control, and study all you can on the topic so you can be the best. And this morning in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, addresses this young church living in this Roman city, this very pagan city, right? He addresses this young church in, the Roman, in this Roman city on how to live if they desired to please God. Pray with me. Father, we dedicate these next few moments to you and just pray that you would rule and reign in this place, in our hearts. Cause us to just uh, be open to what your spirit would say to each and every one of us, Lord, that we would not just be hearers, but we would become doers, that we would apply it, things to our life where it needs to be applied, that we would grow our relationship with one another and most of all with you. So we give you this time, anoint me, speak through me in only way that you can today, Lord, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. First Thessalonians chapter 4. We're going to read all the way down through verse 12 this morning. We'll stop up uh, periodically, so just hold your device open if you would until we're done reading all of it. So Paul begins here in chapter 4, verse 1. He says, finally, brothers, we instructed you on how to live. There it is, how to live. If you want to underline, circle, those are the words, those three words. We instructed you on how to live in order to please God as in fact you are living. So he's not saying we, we instructed you how to live in order to please other people. Right? He's coming right out in order to please God. I want to stop here for a minute. I want to do a quick word study on this word, please. Okay? In the context that it's being used here to please God, it comes from, uh, comes from a Greek word, arisko, arisko, and originally meant to set up a positive relation, to, to be agreeable with an exciting emotion. Okay, so with this definition in mind, listen to how this verse would read if we were to carry out this whole word, please. This is how, how it would read. It would, see, it would read, finally, brothers, we instruct you how to live with a positive relationship, agreeable with excitement as you live for God, as in fact you are living. 
to please God, to have a positive relationship with him, to be agreeable with, with his teachings and be excited about the things of God, to please God. That's what it means in this text, to please him. It's pretty profound. And, and it goes on in the verse, he goes on, now we ask you, and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. To do it more and more. To, to seek out to please God more and more. Don't cover your light. Let it shine brighter and brighter. Especially as you see the days of evil. The days of wickedness increase. Now is the time more and more to seek to please God. And verse 2. For you know what instructions we we gave you about the authority of the Lord Jesus. It is God's will that you should be sanctified. Underline that word. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable. Not in passionate lust like the heathen. He's talking about non-believers. He's talking about people outside the church. Not in passionate lust like the heathen. Those that don't know God, he says. So this doesn't even apply to them because they don't know God. They don't care about the things of God because they don't believe in God. So he's not talking to these people. He's talking to believers. And that in this matter, no one should wrong his brother or take advantage of him. The Lord will punish men for all such sins as we have already told you and warned you. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, he who rejects this instruction does not reject man, but God who gives you his Holy Spirit. Just hold your place right there. We'll be on to verse nine in a few, in a few minutes. So here... In these first eight verses, Paul reminds them. He reminds this early, this church plant. He reminds this young uh, uh, group of believers in this very secular, very uh, paganistic city. He reminds them that they were already instructed on how to live a life that pleases God. To be positive, agreeable, and excited about the things of God. And then he goes on to encourage them, to remind them on how to live, on how to live. He uses one word in these eight verses that we need to take a closer look at this morning if we also, if we, if you also desire to live a life to please God. And here's the one word, I alluded to it already. It is sanctified or sanctification. How many of you guys use that word every day in your vocabulary as you live out in the world? You don't walk up and greet people? Hi, I'm Jay. I'm sanctified. Glad to meet you. You could say that. Because we'll look at the definition. We don't use that word, right? And in fact, uh, they also, a lot of people say for Christianese, you should not use those kind of words because, you know, it's weird to some people. But Paul clearly uses it, and it is a word that we clearly, each and every one of us, shouldn't be afraid of. We should really honor it, and we should grow to understand what it really means. See, these words, sanctification and holiness, you'll see the word holiness a lot. These two words come from the same Greek word, meaning to be set apart. To be set apart. You could walk up to strangers now and say, hi, hi, my name is Jay and I'm set apart. <laughs> okay. Have a good day. <laughs> but that's what you're saying. That's what being sanctified and sanctification is. You are set apart. Sanctification, when you become a born again believer of the Lord Jesus Christ... The moment you, you ask him into your heart, you are sanctified. And sanctification is an ongoing process that began that moment you became a born-again believer through your works. No, through the blood of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. When you confessed with your mouth and believed in your heart, you were sanctified. 
Sanctify. That's fun to say, isn't it? You were set apart. Set apart from what? You were set apart from the world. You're a work in progress. You're set apart. God has bigger things for you to do, greater things for you to do. He set you apart to, you, you, you repent, meaning you do a 180 and turn from your sin. So you're set apart. You're moving away from your sin and you're drawing closer to God. You're set apart. You're sanctified. And that's what it means when, when it's in the Bible it says holy. That's what it means as well. You're set apart. The Bible refers to God as holy. How many of you know God is truly set apart from the rest of us? He is set apart. He is holy. He knows no sin. He's the target. He's what we're aiming to be like. He, he's not of this world. So he is set apart. And we as believers are not of this world either. We're living in this world, but we're not of this world because we're sanctified. We are set apart. Sanctification continues. It continues throughout your life as a born again disciple of Jesus. Now, thankfully, we have God's word, right? We have the Bible and we have the Holy Spirit living in us to help us in our sanctification process. I know I could not do it on my own. Amen? The Bible says when you become a born again believer, a disciple, a born again disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are marked with the seal, the seal of the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit in you. If the Holy Spirit is in you, trust me, you are set apart. You are set apart. Now understand to be in the process of sanctification, living a life set apart from the things of this world means we live to, as Paul mentioned, are you ready for this? We live to, as Paul mentioned, to avoid, to avoid and have self-control. We're set apart. So we live to avoid and have self-control in our life in this sanctification process. Here in these verses, Paul mentions, mentions to avoid sexual immorality. Everybody have your seatbelts on. Paul says to avoid sexual immorality. Before we go any further, we need to talk about this. Now, this may shock some of you. This may shock some of you. This may shock some of you. God created sex. It was God's idea. God did not create a man and a woman and then one day look down and go, oh my goodness, look at what they're doing. What have I done? God created sex and it's okay to talk about sex in the church because the church needs to teach it. The church needs to talk about it because the world sure talks about it. And the world sure teaches about it. And it totally contradicts what God has to say in his word about it. Are you with me? You see, God created, he created sex. First of all, we know he created it to fill the earth. He said to be fruitful and multiply, to fill the earth. And that's how that happens. I think we all get it. And here's another reason. He also created it for pleasure between one man and one woman. He created it for pleasure between one man and one woman. We know that because in Genesis chapter two, it talks about how God created one man and one woman and he did the first marriage ceremony. He created them and he said the two will become one. That means they're having sex, people. They become one flesh. It's powerful. He created it. We also know Jesus talked about uh, marriage, right? He talked about it in Matthew chapter 5 and in Matthew chapter 19 when Jesus was talking about divorce. And in Matthew chapter 19, Jesus quoted Genesis chapter 2. The two will become one. 
So sex is God's idea. God had a plan from the beginning how it was supposed to work. God created marriage. Marriage was God's idea between a man and a woman. It's in the word of God. If you believe the word of God is the infallible, infallible word of God, then you understand that this is God's plan for sex. So sexual immorality, anytime you see that in the Bible where you read and you read sexual immorality, just plug it into your brain. It's talking about any sex outside of marriage between one man and one woman, period. That's it. That's the definition. You still with me? All right, I'm going to, uh, the old guy's going to stop talking about sex for a few minutes. Are you happy? So why mention, this is the interesting part about our text today. Why mention only the, the sin of sexual immorality in, in this text? Yes, we are certainly called to avoid all sin, cheating, lying, stealing, murder, and coveting, all, all, all sin. We're, we're called to avoid it all. But why doesn't Paul say this in our text? It is God's will that you should be sanctified, set apart, that you should avoid all sin. Why does he say that? To avoid everything that harms our relationship with God. And I believe the answer is found in another writing of Paul when he's address, addressing the Corinthians that were dealing with some major issues as well as this church living in, in a heathen city, a pagan city where sexual immorality was running rampant. And he writes this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 through 20. He says to them, everything is permissible for me, meaning he's free in Christ. All right, we're free in Christ. Everything is permissible for me as long as we don't go against the teachings of Jesus and sin. Many people in our society, in our culture, say, I am a born-again believer of Jesus. Everything is permissible for me, so I don't have to change. Good luck with that when you stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Meaning that if you choose to do things that you shouldn't do, like take drugs or alcohol or whatever, whatever you fill in the blank, and you become addicted now because you used your freedom because you thought you had the freedom, now you become mastered by anything and you shouldn't have went there to begin with. He says, food for the stomach and the stomach for the food, but God will destroy them both. The body is not meant, listen to this, the body is not meant for sexual immorality. The body is not met, meant for sex outside of marriage, right? But for the Lord and the Lord for the body, by his power, God raised the Lord from the dead and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? So he's saying anybody outside of marriage between this one man and one woman. And he's using this, this uh, word prostitute, another woman. He says, never do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body. So they've united themselves, their flesh together, and it wasn't meant to be that way. For it is said that two will become one flesh. But he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. And he says this, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You belong to him. You're his temple. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. That's some powerful stuff, church. Sexual immorality, any sex outside of marriage between one man and one woman violates God's plan for our lives in two ways. These are the two ways it violates God's plan for our lives. There's probably more, but these are the two big ones. 
First, it exposes people to the risk of disease or other, or other bodily harm. All right, let's just be honest. If you're, if, if you're going to go out and have sex with multiple ple- people outside of what God has created between one man and one woman, there's a good chance you're going to get a sexually transmitted disease. And some of them aren't curable because it, it's not God's plan. And second, it threatens a healthy marital relationship. It not only uh, threatens the healthy marital relationship between trust between a man and a woman, it also uh, violates your healthy relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ because because fulfillment in marriage parallels the intimate relationship we as believers have with Jesus. Still with me? Now listen, I may be 55, but I know the desires of our flesh are real and powerful. Anybody in here today that has a heartbeat knows exactly what I'm saying. Okay, because we live in the flesh and the Bible says we, the flesh and the spirit are at constant conflict with each other. The flesh wants to be pleasured and desired and the spirit and we wants us to fulfill the things of God. So we're in constant conflict with each other. Let's, let's not be ignorant to that. Okay, it's true. The Lord knows that if we can avoid sexual immorality, this is why I believe this is the only thing that Paul mentions when, in this scripture. The Lord knows that if we can avoid sexual immorality, we will be stronger to avoid the sins we commit out of our bodies, right? When we sin sexually, it's in our body, it's personal, our flesh, we fulfill those desires. But when we do other sins, it's outside of our bodies. And the Lord knows that if we can avoid at all costs, flee from and avoid sexual immorality, then we will be stronger and have more self-control to live out our faith in the other areas. Right? It's true. If you read other places that Paul writes, for instance, like Ephesians chapter four, he talks, he, he also is talking about living for God. And in that, he not only mentions sexual immorality, but he mentions a lot of other things that displease God. But here in this, in this text that we're reading, he only mentions the one. Because I believe it's the one that we really truly need to master and, and have self-control and defeat in our lives. Have you guys had enough on that subject? All right. Let's turn back now to 1 Thessalonians to look at the second way Paul is encouraging this young church and us as well to live in a way that pleases God. Remember, this is all, Paul is reminding them, encouraging them to live in a way that pleases God. He goes on, verse nine, now about brotherly love. Oh, excuse me, you can circle that, whatever, underline it. Now about brotherly love, we do not need to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do, you do love all the brothers throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers, to do so more and more. So here, in verse 2, in these two verses... Paul reminds and encourages them how to live a life that pleases God, to be positive, agreeable, excited about the things of God by mentioning brotherly love. Brotherly love. Brotherly love comes from the Greek word Philadelphia. How many of you heard of a little small place called Philadelphia? I've never been there, but we know that that people often refer to it as, uh, how do they say it? City of brotherly love. Oh, they didn't make that up. That's why it's called Philadelphia. It's a Greek word. It is the combination of, of two words. Phileo, which means love, and adelphos, which means brother. It literally means the love of brothers. This Greek word, Philadelphia, literally describes the love, uh, the love born again disciples of Jesus 
treasure among themselves. Right? We, we treasure the love among ourselves in the church, brotherly love. Again, at this point, he's just talking to the believers in the church of how we express brotherly love. We are to have brotherly love and sister, you know, brother refers to both, okay? We come for hopefully one of many reasons. You come to church on a Sunday or whatever other day, you come because you want a fellowship, right? You want to have this Philadelphia, you want to have this brotherly love among uh, believers, right? You worship, you pray, we, we listen to the word, we apply. But one of the reasons we come is to treasure the love we have for one another, right? Talked about this last week. We should treasure that love we have for one another. And we're going to mess up. I promise you, if you stay in this church long enough, I'm going to say or do something that you're not going to agree with. I'm not going to uh, wave to you in the hallway because I'm, I'm not good at multitasking anymore. Something's going to happen and I'm not going to do something and, and you're not going to feel brotherly love for me. And let me just say right now, I'm sorry. Okay? But we all do it. But how we respond Bond in this brotherly love, how Jesus describes us to respond is what is important. I picked on a couple of people in the, in the service. I'm going to pick on new people, right? So if we truly have brotherly love, we know what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 18 about when somebody offends us. Right? When somebody offends us, Jesus said, when you're offended in the church and somebody offends you, you leave and you don't tell the pastor and you don't tell anybody. You just leave and you go to another church because they'll never offend you. That's what he said in Matthew 18. Is that not what he said? That's not what he said, is it? What he said is, Pastor Jay, when David Gerling offends you, does something, you are to go to your brother and confront him in love and say, hey, David, you know that thing that you did? Why did you do that thing that you did? And David's going to say, what? I got a bad memory. He's got a bad memory. And David's going to say, it's because I wanted to do it. And Pastor Jay's going to confront him some more and hopefully he'll see the error of his way if, if I'm right. And he'll say, you're right, I shouldn't have done that, I'm sorry. If he doesn't, the Bible says, you take a brother with you or sister and, and you talk some more. You know, and if that doesn't work, you may have to get leadership involved. Right, but David may say, Pastor Jay, you're crazy. I don't even know what you're talking about. In my own interpretation, I was offended by something he didn't even do. So Pastor Jay has to apologize to David. Because it's brotherly love. And guess what? Our relationship grows stronger because we learn to negotiate, to talk. When you talk to people one-on-one -on -one and share how you're feeling in the right way, you will have a greater relationship with that person when it's over. Versus do what most people do. I'm out of here. I don't want to be part of the solution in a church. I just want to be part of the problem and leave. That's what people do in churches today, especially in America. I'm just going to tell you like it is. Well, where is so-and-so? I don't know. I haven't seen them in a while. They don't answer my phone call. I'm trying to check on them. Well, I heard they left because they were mad. Oh, okay. Well, why were they mad? I don't know. They were just mad. Well, I wonder if they have ever read their Bible because that's really not a way to even leave a church. You should seek the blessing before you leave if it's God really asking you to leave because I promise you with all my heart, you're going to have a problem at the other church and then you're going to leave that pretty soon. In our city of Idaho Falls, you're out of churches. So I guess you're going to have to start your own church. And pretty soon you will offend yourself and then that church will close down too. That's not how you grow, people. That's not how it's done. And let me just say one more thing about Matthew 18 and, and that whole process. If, if I was to go to somebody and say, 
Don, I got to tell you what David said or did to me. And Don, a strong, spiritually mature person he is, he's going to say, I'm not part of the solution, so I'm not part of the conversation. Get away from me. You see, if you're not part of the solution with the problem, you should not be part of the conversation. You should say, hey, I'm not part of the solution, but let me hold your hand and let's go talk to these people together. That's how you stop gossip in a church. That's how you grow spiritually. I don't even know where any of that came from, but we'll move on. You see, it only makes sense if you desire to live a life that pleases God to to Philadelphia each other because of the two greatest commands given, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love. uh, uh, And the first, this is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. The desire to live a life to please God must, without debate, include brotherly love, period. It's not even open for debate. You can't decide who you're going to love and who you're not going to love because they may or may not offended you or whatever because you don't like the color of their hair, you don't like their age, you don't like this, you don't like that. It's not debatable. You have to love everybody. If you are a born-again disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're marked with a seal, the Holy Spirit is in you, and you are set apart, you are to love everybody. And Paul is addressing the church, everybody in the church. You might not agree with some things people say, and you know, you might not prefer to be around them that much, but it doesn't mean you don't love them, okay? The desire to live a life to please God must, without debate, include brotherly love. It is one way we know that we have truly passed from death to light, that we are born again, that we are a new creation in Christ because we have brotherly love. Without any claim to know God or love him is a lie. So you, you may know somebody that claims to love God and, and they can, uh, on, when it's time to worship, they can lift their hands and they can worship and they can sing the greatest hymns and sing about how much they love God and then turn around in, in the next instant and be rude and hateful and not love their brother and sister in the Lord. It says this in 1 John about these people. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God who he has not seen. And he has has given us this command. Whoever loves God must also, must also love his brother. So Paul urges this young church and us as well to do so more and more. Listen to me, you guys, as the the world gets more evil and as wickedness continues, as we know the Bible said, wickedness will increase before the day of his return, which, by the way, we're we're not going to go into chapter 4 next week about the rapture because it's Memorial Day weekend. I know some of you won't be here. So we're going to wait a couple of weeks because I want to dive deep and heavy into that, right? As we see more and more, to love more and more, our world is full of hate, isn't it? It's sad to watch. More than ever, more than ever, we as the body of Christ must rise above the hate and not only have brotherly love for one another, which he's calling us to do, but he's also calling us to love those outside the church. How does that song go, go by Jackie D. Shanahan? Well, you guys don't know Jackie D. Shanahan? What's wrong with you? She wrote the song back in the 70s. Come on. You know the song. When I start to sing it, Forgive me for that, but when I start to sing it, you guys are going to probably help me finish the words like they did at the first service. What the world, sing it to these youth group. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing that there's just too little of. What the world needs now is love, Sweet love, and I love this last sentence. 
No, not just for some, but for everyone. Don't worry, Daniel, I'm not taking your job. Listen, you're, we're sanctified. We're set apart. We're not to be haters in a world full of hate. We're called to love. Find creative ways to love people, to love on people. That's what we're called to do. And that's what the world needs. So once again, let's turn back to First Thessalonians for a final look at how Paul is encouraging this young church and us as well to live in a way that pleases God. First Thessalonians chapter four, verse 11 and 12, he says, make it your ambition, circle that word if you would, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business. Wow, Ooh. to mind your own business and to work with your hands just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders. And so now he's bringing in the outsiders outside the church. And so that you will not be dependent on anybody. That's pretty in your face, isn't it? Here in these final two verses, Paul reminds and encourages them on how to live a life that pleases God to be positive, agreeable, exciting by calling them to have ambition. Ambition. Anybody in here have any ambition? Wow, nobody. <laughs> Few people? Ambition. Those of you that raised your hand and have ambition, at the end of the service, I want you to come up here. I want to get your name and phone number because I need you to mow my yard once a week. <laughs> I've lost all ambition to mow my yard. By the way, that's why God gave us grandkids and teenagers Amen. to mow our yards. <laughs> Just kidding. The definition of ambition is a strong desire to do or achieve something to see it big, right? Ambition, to see something big, a big ambition. Now this reminds me of a salesman who passed by a certain corner of the street each day and uh, on his way to work. And after a week, he began, uh, after a week of going by the street corner, uh, he began to, to pity, to have pity on a boy who was trying really hard, but he was struggling to sell his little puppy. The salesman knew uh, the boy didn't see it big enough. He didn't have the right ambition to see it big enough to, to sell his puppy. He didn't have the knowledge. So he stopped and he said, he said this, son, do you really want to sell this dog? And the boy replied, I, I certainly do. Well, you're never going to sell him until you learn to see it big, to go big, to have a bigger ambition to do it. What I mean is this, take this dog home, clean, clean him up, doll him up, raise your price and make people think you're getting something big and you'll sell him. The next day, the salesman, he came by and there was the boy with the puppy that was groomed and perfumed with a big sign that read this, tremendous puppy for sale, $5,000. <laughs> the salesman, he, he gulped and he realized he had forgotten to tell the boy about keeping it simple. On his way home that evening, he stopped by to tell the boy the other half of the formula, only to discover that the boy, the boy was gone, that the, the puppy was gone, and the sign that he had was laying on the street, and it, it said, sold, written across the big uh, letters. The salesman, he, he couldn't believe it. This kid couldn't have sold the dog for $5,000. So his curiosity, it got the best of him. So he went to the boy's home and he rang the doorbell. The boy came to the door and the salesman, he, he blurted out, son, you didn't really sell that dog for 5,000 now, did you? 
And the boy replied, yes, sir, I did. And I want to thank you for all your help. And the salesman said, how in the world did you do it? And the boy replied, oh, it was easy. I just took two $2,500 cats in exchange. <laughs> Which, by the way, cats are not worth. Oh. Any dog lovers? Any cat lovers? You see, this, this story reminds us that seeing things big, having ambition is, is, is good, right? It reminds us that, that seeing things big, having ambition is good. Just don't be misguided or misled in the ambition so you lose the respect of others. Okay? And what do I mean by that? If you, if you turn back and look at what Paul wrote and what we read, he said, he said this, be ambitious, see things big to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business and to work with your hands. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. Okay, so, so yes, you're a born again believer. You are set apart for the things of the Lord. But lead a quiet life, love people, do things, uh, you know, with a benevolent heart, do things. Don't let your right hand know what your left hand's doing as you give, right? Do those kind of things that Jesus taught. Lead a quiet life in, in your faith, right? And to mind your own business. So don't be ready to interject on every little thing you see on Facebook because these people gotta know what I believe. They gotta know. You know, and Paul is telling them in their, in their social media setting, because they would go to the city gate. That's where people gathered. Paul is no doubt telling them, hey, look, don't get caught up in all that stuff. Be set apart from the world, but, but mind your own business and work hard with your hands to supply the needs of your family. Don't rely on people outside the church. Don't hurt your witness for the Lord. Be ambitious. And Paul is encouraging this young church to have ambition, seeing things big in a way they live their lives before those around them by living quiet lives, by working hard and minding their own business. Now, again, this speaks once again to what I spoke about last week. If you do not have something nice to say, don't say anything at all. Yes. By all means, be ready to speak the truth in love. Be ready to share the hope that should be found in you as you live a life to please God in a world that is definitely not living to please God, are they? So I'm not saying that we go out in the world and not speak up or say things at all. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is if you're set apart from the world and if you're living a life to please God, you're avoiding things in your life, you have self-control, you're loving others, you have brotherly love, you're living a quiet life, you're minding your own business, people will see the hope that is in you. And then the hope that is in you from a desperate world that doesn't have hope, that is living in despair, I promise you if they see those things in you because you are truly set apart, then they will ask, like the Bible says, be ready to share the hope that is in you. Then, then they were asked, bingo, bingo, right? The door has opened. Now you can start share the truth in love because they have asked you. And you'll tell, tell your story. Are you with me? Pastor Daniel, if you come, that'd be wonderful. So, I started our time together by asking if you would know how to live. If you would know how to live. I went on to say, no matter what profession you are currently in or what you set your heart on doing, to be the best, you must be loyal, ambitious, put in the time, practice, have self-control, and study all you can on the topic. 
It's no different if you want to live to please God. If you truly understand that you are sanctified and that you are set apart. You are called to avoid things in this life. You are called to please God. You are called to be the best you can be. You will make mistakes. You will mess up. Praise the Lord. We can repent, turn from those things, ask for forgiveness, get help, and get beyond those things. And hopefully, through these 12 verses this morning, you can see that if, if, that's the question here for each one of us, If you desire to live a life that pleases God, you must be loyal to Jesus despite what the world may say. It's only going to get heated more and more. Be loyal to Jesus despite what the world may say. You must be ambitious to follow the teachings of Jesus. You must put into practice the teachings of Jesus. You must learn self-control over the desires of the flesh and God will help you. You must study and meditate on God's word. Let the spirit, let God speak through his word to you. Study, read it, meditate. Even if you only read a couple of of words or a couple of sentences a day and you meditate, it's better than nothing. God will take that and he will grow it. This is how you and I as born again disciples of Jesus please him. Back to verse one with the Greek translation in it. If you remember, it reads this way. Born again disciples of Jesus to please him. We must have a positive relationship a positive relationship with him, about him. We must be agreeable on all the the teachings that God teaches in the Bible. We must learn to agree with it. We may not understand it, but we have to agree that God knows best. God has our back. God knows the things that hurt us. God doesn't want to kill the fun and joy in our life. Jesus said, I have come to give you joy. Jesus said, I have come to give you the abundant life, not the life the world has to offer. It is full of despair. It is full of disease, like I mentioned. It is full of hate. It is full of everything opposite of who God is. And we should be excited as you as we live to please God. People should see excitement in us as we go out into the world. There's something different about that cat. There's something different. There's something different. What is so different? Why are they so happy all the time? Look at the wheels on the bus in their life have fallen off and they're just so happy. What is up with you? I'm glad you asked because I am sanctified. I am set apart. I am a born again disciple of Jesus. And let the Holy Spirit speak through you with power and he'll put words in your mouth. And when you're done, you're going to go, whoa. Because God wishes none to perish and he will use you. So let me read it all again. A positive relationship agreeable with excitement as you live for God as in effect you are living. And I pray and hope my desire for each and every one of you is that you desire to please God more and more every day. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this time we've had this morning. I'm thankful that we have the living, breathing word of God. I'm thankful that you give us instructions on how to live a life separate from the world, to please you, but to be in the world, to win outsiders to you that don't know anything about you. And God, help us not to be frustrated with people, Lord, that don't have a clue about who you are and your teachings, God. We, we have to remember not everybody knows, not everybody agrees. Help us, God, to, to let you speak through us the appropriate time and the appropriate words. Lord, help us to just have a greater love not only within the church fellowship, which we need more and more, but also for a world 
that needs to know your love. I thank you for our time this morning. And I pray your spirit will take this message and resonate deeply with every spirit in this place or is listening. And you would do something very powerful and profound in every life that is here today. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you need prayer this morning, please uh, come on down. I'd love to pray for you. I'm putting the money back in my pocket. You can drink the egg if you like for lunch. Feel free, David. God bless. If you need prayer, we'd love to pray with you. Pray you have a great week. Get some coffee and, and share some brotherly love with one another.